Web, uh, a few months ago, you brought out a very important policy brief that looked at the peaking of emissions and yeah. alternative scenarios for getting to net zero emissions. And you mm. compared India to other countries mm. and what they've done. You're bringing out another important yeah. document. Tell us what's different. Yeah. So the first one was a foundational piece. Mm. It, it tried to explore what are the alternatives available for India and what are really the fun, you know fundamental underlying drivers for uh, you know all the alternative targets. This one, the new one that we're bringing out is about sectoral analysis. Mm -hmm. So getting deeper into sectors to better understand the feasibility of the transition is absolutely critical. And that is what this piece focuses on. So why is this important when you say understanding the feasibility of transition? Yeah. What does that mean for a specific sector? Yeah. Give us an example. Yeah. So, so let, let me talk about solar. We know that solar, the progress on solar is great and the outlook is also very, very positive. Mm -hmm. But in, in a net zero future, what we are talking about is around let's say 7500 gigawatts of solar based electricity and that is what the research says in a net zero future. Now is that even you know feasible? What kind of capital is required? What does it mean for waste? You know, many, many of these feasibility aspects, political economy aspects, what we will better understand only after doing sectoral analysis. And just for our viewers to understand, today and yeah. this is already quite revolutionary, India has yeah more than 100 gigawatts yeah. of uh, solar and wind and biomass and you're saying now solar has to get to 7500 gigawatts yes. Yes. to get to a net zero story sometime yes. later in the century yes right. yes so it is huge you know as we are saying and apart from that there could be other examples also uh, for example truck segment mm. uh, is going to be have to become huge all the oil has to go out of the system coal has to go out of the system so cross across sectors, you know, uh, it has to. Be so what will trucks run on? Electricity mm. and also if hydrogen becomes successful, then right. hydrogen would come in only in the long distance part of it. Sure, right. sure. Yeah. So yeah. So these are uh, looking at different sectors. Mm. Uh, there would be different examples, but mm -hmm. that is what we need to essentially understand. Sure. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question, Arjuna. On the uh, you have you have been heavily involved in the in this negotiation debate and the climate policy debate. Mm. So how do you think this information is you know valuable from that perspective? I think the first thing we have to recognize, Weber, is as a country mm. that, you know, the, the climate crisis is already here. 75% of India's districts are hotspots for extreme climate events. Now, we are not the culprits of climate change, but we are certainly the victims. So the net zero framing or the peaking emissions framing helps us to look at the science. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change has just told us mm -hmm. that we are going to breach the one and a half degrees uh, barrier uh, over and above, above pre-industrial levels within the next two decades, maybe within a decade. Mm. Now, if we looked at our own national interest, we have to see how do we make our economy more resilient against the climate crisis while making it more dynamic and competitive. I think there's another dimension to it, which is equity and justice. Mm -hmm. Another CW research uh, recently brought out that between 2008 and 2020 alone, mm -hmm. developed countries had emitted 25 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over and above what they were supposed to, simply by not meeting their own targets. Now, that is nine years of India's emissions. So, as these countries gobble up the carbon space, there's less and less left for others. Yes. And I think it's important that we engage with this net zero conversation to be able to call out and demand that these countries get to net zero much sooner yes. so that it gives us a little bit more room to develop. Yes, yes, that's absolutely true. But tell me, uh, Weber, again, th these sectoral analysis that you've done, transport, industry, electricity, what do you think? Is this going to be a call to action? It is indeed a call to action, but it is an informed call to action. Okay. It is not just a call to action in response so to all the politics, all yeah. the politics that is going around. It mm. is an extremely important informed call to action. Mm. There are many different actors that have to make a move, have to start making decisions. Mm. There needs to be some long-term alignment in the direction. And we hope that this kind of analysis informs government policy and gives a very clear, long-term and credible policy signal sure. around which all the actions align. So it is indeed a call to action, but not just action, but it is informed action. That is absolutely extremely critical. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the positioning of the government of India, we know there is a lot of politics on the net zero issue. These, these kind of long-term analysis are very powerful in informing the positions of 
you know, different countries. So, how do you think this could inform, you know, government of India's position? Well, I think India will, of course, have to take its own decision when, if and when it brings out a net zero target. But I think, more importantly, India has to be very clear. It has to bat on the front foot and say, we are a climate leader that delivers. We deliver on our commitments. Uh, whether it is getting to 40 percent uh, non-fossil capacity, reducing emissions intensity, we are on track. But we also know that the world has to do a lot more, India has to do a lot more. So on top of saying we deliver, we have to also demand that other countries get to net zero faster. That opens up some space for us. But we have to also demand that investment comes to us. Emerging economies like India is where energy demand will grow. We want that energy to be clean. Investment has to flow commensurate to the policies we are setting forth. And it has to, money has to come at a cost that we can afford. Uh, and the third dimension, I think, is very critical about investing in the technologies of the future. Your analyses yeah. are based on our current understanding of technologies. But if we have to suck carbon out of the atmosphere, if we have to go really big on green hydrogen, if we have to do something else, we have to be co-developers of that technology, not just recipients of that technology. Mm. Then we co-own the intellectual property. Then we have a stake in the future cleaner, greener economy. And that's what will ultimately provide the political foundation, the backing from the people for this transition that the economy has to go through. Thank mm -hmm. you.